Okay, good evening, everybody, and apologies for the delay. Um, welcome to Children and Young People Scrutiny panel this evening. And just to start by presenting apologies from the chair, Councillor Bacon, who's not very well this evening, so I'm your stand-in. And before we start, I wanted to present my apologies for non-attendance on Monday evening to the amazing um, Achievement Awards. Uh, I had intended to come, but I had um, a hospital thing, so I couldn't come. Um, and I understand they were entirely successful, so I would like to extend congratulations to everybody. Um, all the young people and the people involved. So thank you for that. So we move on now straight to the agenda. Apologies for absence. I have Councillor Thorpe. Um, I don't know if we have any more. Looking round, I, I think that's the only person missing actually. Oh, Odette. Councillor McKay, yeah, she's, um, she's not in the country at the moment, so no more, okay. Uh, urgent business, don't have any urgent business, so declarations of interest, I see none, so we move on to item four, um, the children's services quarterly performance monitoring. I think this is you, Joe, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so what we normally do is we pick out the two stars in a wish. We pick out the... Um, things that you know, that, that, did, that you're most secure about and and the things that you're targeting rather than read through the whole report so over to you joe and thank you very much thank you chair yeah i'm going to work on the assumption that people have read the report beforehand so i think because we're in that time of the year where we've just come out of the summer we're just into a new term it's very buoyant so i've probably more in my schools headspace than sometimes if you get me in the summer I might be more in I don't know the social care headspace so I'm um, grasping the sort of the principle of schools um, we're in that sort of position where we're just starting to get a semblance of what some of our outcomes for summer 2024 were looking like so there's always a bit of a lag on some of that data hence there's no actual tangible figures in the report but what I did commit to in the report to give a bit of a verbal sense at the meeting knowing that we would have that um, data sort of starting to come to our disposal around the general picture. So I think it's a really, really positive one for this year. I think overall our standards in our schools have been on a sort of slow and steady um, up where our secondary schools are concerned. We know we're working from a foundation of exceptional results in our primary sector overall. Yes, some differences between certain schools, but overall we have some of the you know, primary results that any local authority would be, be proud of. And I'm pleased to say that provisionally, whilst I can't give you precise numbers, we're very confident that the pattern this year will be one again of our key stage two outcomes um, exceeding um, most certainly comfortably England and very likely above London, if not in line with London. Um, so there's been a little bit of a provisional increase, it looks like, across England, um, and we are definitely sort of following that pattern. Um, so really good. And I think sometimes, unfortunately, I do always bang the drum for primary results because they do get slightly masked. I think it's fair that there is always a bit of more focus on our secondary sector. But a really, really good set of key stage two results um, to, to celebrate when the final data comes out. Similarly, um, key stage four and five, um, it's a bit of a different beast because whereas we get um, quite early data feeds from the DfE around our primary sector, secondary, there is quite a lag because it's a much more complex process with a million and one exam boards, et cetera, et cetera. So we always find ourselves in a position where even our schools won't have an absolute finite set of data, you know, sort of a finished product now. But the schools, as always, were very accommodating with sharing um, their headline results for us um, over the two weeks in the summer. Um, and again, it's looking like a positive picture around seeing some improvements at key stage four around the proportion of pupils overall that are achieving what is classed as, they call it the basic pass, but a level four, or sorry, a grade four is sort of old school C. Um, so in my mind, that is not a basic 
pass, that is an exceptional outcome for those, those children. So we're, we're very likely to see in the final data an increase in the proportion of children that have achieved um, a level four in both, um, I should say a grade four in both English and maths. And we've also mirrored that at level five, which is classed as the sort of the strong pass. So almost the plus. plus. Um, and that's against the backdrop as we, we anticipate that the, the England results might see a bit of a dip in English. So if we've actually bucked the trend on the combined measure, that indicates that we're going to buck the trend around a, a, a reduction in, in English attainment by Key Stage 4. Key Stage 5 is an even more complex beast this early in, in the day. But what we do feel that we're going to see this year is, full disclosure, we're always going to have a gap between the Greenwich results and England when it comes to the proportion of entries that are achieving the very highest grades. So your A star A, A star B, A star C. But the provisional data that's emerging indicates we have made progress on all three of those measures. Um, so we are we are catching up, albeit slowly, but we are we are catching up. And what sits below that that even I'm not privy to and we will get privy to it as the data comes out, but what you hear anecdotally from our colleagues that are out on the ground on the, on the day, and, and I know, you know certainly some councillors are out within, within schools and sort of celebrating, but what we hear from our school improvement is just some of those really lovely stories of just the individual successes. And we, we did sort of anecdotally hear about from one of our special schools how proud they were of a young person who achieved, yes, they're not going to be a set of results that some people would sort of, but for that young person, you know, that was shared with us, just, just how excited everyone was for that. And that, I think that's what brings it home to us. Behind all those big numbers, there are individual children who have, have achieved wonderfully. So I think that's the real positive in the, result, in the, in the report this year. Um, full disclosure, you would have seen it in, in the report. I think the area where we know there is still work to be done and it is a bit of a revolving door conversation here is again unfortunately we have seen a bit of a decline in the tail end of last year and into this year around our um, timeliness of um, EHCP processes. Um, there's obviously um, information in the report around some of the challenges the service are continuing to face around recruitment. The positive out of that is we do have now in Martin Patterson a new strategic lead for that area. Martin was within the service, so there is some continuity and sort of continuum. He's a hugely experienced um, person. So, and the team have been doing a huge amount of recruitment to try and fill some of those really key posts to make sure that caseloads are a little bit more manageable. So I think the message is we're fully aware of the figures are not where they need to be, but there is a plan of action led by Vicky and Martin and obviously supported by Florence to, to keep a grip on that. So it would be you know, pointless for me to sit here and, and not say that that's the one glaring red in the report and we're not gonna pretend it isn't there. Um, but then I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Right, thank you ever so much, Joe. And actually that was my question, so you won't be surprised to learn as soon as I saw it. Um, and we shared that just a few moments ago. So good luck to Vicky and Martin with that one. Um, and we will look forward to a feedback on that. My, um, my observation was um, that, um, I, I mean, there are some really good, good reports here, but we've got a lot of ambers. You can't see the ambers on this, but a the, the, the lot. I listed about eight areas where we had um, shall we say, a middle of the road, an amber indication. And I think we would be looking at those in the next quarter to see how much movement and see what, what measures are in place. Uh, members of the panel will obviously have questions about, about the performance data, but, um, you know, things like um, NEETS, you know, we don't know what activities they're doing. There, there are these issues. Where we see an amber indication, I think, I think that, you know, I counted eight areas, and I think, that, I think we're looking to move some of those as much as possible. I don't know if you've got any views on that. Yes, yeah, so certainly. So I think it's fair to say we use amber sometimes as a, um, a bit of a flag to sort of give you the reassurance it's an area that we're monitoring. 
and sometimes that monitoring might be for different reasons. It may be because there's been sort of actually some sort of change in the background, which sometimes can destabilise things, whether it's not, it's a national change, a sort of a, a, a sort of a, something like that, or where we're just sort of feeling, sometimes it's that we sort of feel we've plateaued a bit. So, you know, we know there are some measures where we're, we're always going to be a little bit adrift from, say, London, because that's the nature of the beast here. But what we are not complacent about is where we might plateau. So we still expect some, some sort of progress. But around the neat one, um, that is a figure that kind of goes up and down every quarter because it's always a different cohort moving in and out um, as children have birthdays and, 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 and that. But I think, I suppose, the, the, sort of, the, the sort of position there is we're at sort of just under 4%. Um, which we would like it to be much lower than that. We'd like it to be more in the middle, three percent. So we're not hugely adrift of London, which is our sort of benchmark for that. So the latest London data was 3.4 percent, where 3.8 percent. In real terms, to close that gap between 3.8 and 3.4, we're probably talking about 20 or 30 young people. So just to try to put into context of the issue. So I think what we're saying there is. You know, compared to England, we're still doing exceptionally well with that cohort, and we've got a very mobile cohort in that sort of space. But that is us just indicating that our aspiration around that measure is definitely to be consistently in line with, with, with London figures. The other area that we did flag in the report um, was around missing. Um, simply, and I think the message there was more, the missing figures are not raising any concern to us in terms of our sense that there's any sort of immediately sort of increased level of risk. Some of it is around we have worked tirelessly to really improve our processes around the monitoring and tracking of missing. So we wanted to use it as an opportunity in the report to sort of say, we are monitoring it because we need to see if this is a pattern that's emerging, have some of our improvements around the tracking, the monitoring, the grip on that area actually led to some more I suppose it's not, the, but some more robust data. So this is actually really our, our, our new normal in a way. But also just to give members a flavor of what is in place around how we manage and how we sort of have that oversight and, and sort of grip on, on missing. Because I think we're mindful that you may not always know what actual processes are in place and how we, how we actually sort of respond to um, a report of a child going missing. So. Um, we included just a little bit more narrative there just to give you a bit of a sense of what, what sort of sits behind some of those figures. Thanks, Joe. thanks. I mean, one of, the, uh, one of the most concerning ones for me is the uh, child, protections, child protection plans issued for the second time, which I can't find at the moment. But, um, but we look forward to that, and that, that's reassuring if, if it's monitoring. I'm going to open up to the rest of Sorry, Florence. Uh, I don't recall an, an amber. There are three areas of amber. One is the secondary school outcomes on Ofsted. There's an amber there. We know that there's a couple of schools that got requires improvement, so that changed that uh, percentage. There's an area about NEAT. And in addition to what Joe said, we have moved the uh, careers, education, information, advice, and guidance to sit under SEND with the new strategic lead because we think that those vulnerable children and the careers, so many of them have special education needs, so we've moved them to align much closer strategically to a vulnerable learner's strategy. And when we feed back on the um, SEND work, we'll also include the careers, education, information and guidance. And the third area, the missing area, the numbers are actually down on last year but we are being much more robust on missing, and the police have got a very dedicated uh, focus on missing now from their inspection. They've recruited a, a new missing coordinator and a new missing strategy, so there's a lot of work happening about missing because it is an important area in terms of early indicators of, of risk outside the home. Um, so I'm confident that we are uh, some really good strategic thinking ahead. The child protection one, I don't recall an amber when I've looked, and I can't see it on there at all, but I'm happy to... Sort of it might be in the actual in data monitor. In the data, okay. It might be in the data monitor. There's, 
there's two measures of child protection repeats. There's, is there ever been a repeat, regardless of when the child was previously subject to a plan, and repeats within two years? Um, and we have seen, it's probably in the larger uh, um, appendices, um, there's some extra measures in, in there where we give you the full set. Um, and I do recall, I, I off the top of my head, I can't remember if it was for this quarter or last, sometimes the measure around repeats in a short period of time, so two years, sometimes we will flag that as amber. The reality on that one is it, it, it is subject to quite a lot of change because we're normally talking about two or three children. And what will happen in the odd quarter is if we have a large sibling group that comes back quickly, it can throw the figure out. So it's one that sort of sometimes what the profile looks like at the start of the year immediately settles down next quarter where actually it, it's a family group of six that have come back in. Proportionately, that's quite a high proportion of, care, of um, CP starts having come in again but what we sometimes find by quarter two we've had no more so actually that six suddenly doesn't look proportionately to be an issue but certainly in that area if there's any concerns across the whole safe but cp is an area where um i think the the um the service so you had an iro report i think the last time i was here the service over that so if I literally had Theresa or, or Catherine sitting here and I said, who were those six children? They'd be able to reel them off <laughs> off the top of their head. They'd know exactly the reasons or why. So I think yeah. we take the point that the yeah. numbers are not great. You know, yeah. I mean, the, the, yeah. the, 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 when you're talking about percentages, you're talking about, if you talk about numbers, you're talking about a smaller number. But nonetheless, it's good to flag it up. So thank you for that. I'll go back to questions from the panel. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. And um, yes, I have to say that Thank you very much. Um, Monday was incredible to um, celebrate the achievements of our young people. And I think they felt, you know, sort of they were really impressed and, and they felt valued um, at being invited along um, to the night. It was brilliant. The, my question really is, I'm going on to, to uh, Ofsted. Now, the Ofsted rules changed, haven't they? And so, whereas you you you, you were down on as you know, sort of whether they are outstanding, what have you. Now it's going to it's got four criteria, hasn't it? Uh, is it am I right? Education, behaviour. It's only because I'm reading. Uh, leadership and attitude to learning. So, how is that going to affect future future data? Yeah. So I was actually talking. To to um, Vicky, who's obviously the AD in this area, about this just the other day, because what we're trying to sort of think ahead is the announcements have been made about the removal of those overarching one sort of word. Um, there isn't a huge amount of clarity at the moment around, probably until we see the first report come out, what will a new report look like? I think our sense is the reports themselves will not be fundamentally different because there is always that focus within the four sort of core areas of, of, of what they look for when they come in to do an inspection. So we were sort of thinking about how do we still, with the removal of that, you know, and I, we get quite divisive, single word, how do you still give the reassurance that there is a grip in schools, there is quality within schools? So we're sort of talking about how we're going to have to sort of look at how we still give that sort of position around a sense of sort of strength and a sense of sort of um, quality still when you haven't got that sort of very sort of binary way of, of measuring it. So until there's a little bit more clarity and actually the reports start coming out, so the new, literally from the first, first of sort of um, inspections that have been done this new term, the new, it's not a, and, and Vicky was very clear as was as, um, Matthew as the head of school improvement, the framework hasn't changed. The nature of how the inspection reports will be written up is the change. So the actual framework of inspection is exactly the same. The nature mm. of the reports will be different. So I think when we start to see the first reports published, we'll get a sense for how they're actually applying that in practice and then how we can respond to it around still giving you that sense of oversight. It could, could, could I just come in there? Because I think what we're looking at here from the point of view of the panel is that the one word judgments were basically to give uh, families and um, parents perhaps the feeling of, of uh, where a school was at. 
Whereas those of us that know about schools know that to contribute to any judgment, you've got to work right through the departments. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to this, frankly, and I think it's a fair judgment for our schools. Um, whether we will have to work hard to actually make sure that the community understands, the outside community actually understands that this is, you know, uh, you might have a lower or a higher judgment in the same school across departments or across facilities. So there is some work to be done, but I think it's going to be good. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. That's fine. One additional thing just for um, information. The, there's a freeze on the single word judgments at the moment, but they're working on a scorecard for implementation in September 2025. So this year will be a little bit unknown exactly what it's going to look like, but there is a lot of work um, and I hope, and there's a lot of uh, new working groups that have been established by Ofsted to look at this very carefully to introduce a scorecard for next year. Okay. So can I just ask? <coughs> so, just to end of the question, talk. It's just um, when we talk in, about sort of the new officers. You, you mentioned the new officers that were going to be sort of employed to help with the EC, EHCP plans. I, I didn't, I mean, it's whether or not Martin Patterson is, is the only person or is there somebody to help him. And also, just wondering again, it is sort of, well, yeah. It, well, how are we, do we know where we are with the new SEND facility, wide horizons yet? Because we, are, we all know we're desperately short of SEND facilities. And has anything happened any further work there? Well, I don't know. I want but I shall just quickly answer. Martin Patterson is the strategic lead for the whole of the SEND and now the CAG service, the Careers Education Information Advice and Guidance Service. And he has a team. He has a service manager. He has a new service manager and two teams um, that work on all the EHCPs. That's one element. Their recruitment has been really challenging. They've now got a full cohort of uh, employed staff not relying on agency staff that came and go and came. So that's a really good news. And we are undertaking more analysis and more understanding of the pathways and the flow of that work. To respond very quickly about Bexley Road and Hargood Road, both of those are on track. Both of those are in development. Um, and I think Bexley Road is scheduled for 2025 and I think Hargood Road is 2026. Any, any more members? Thanks. Um, I'm interested in the statistics where we're a big outlier on the children in our care placed outside the boundary and more than 20 miles away from home. I, I, I see that somewhere it says, is that, is that C-I-N? It says something was given to this on the seven, to this uh, committee on the 17th of April 2024. Well, I don't have that in front of me. Can someone summarise why we're so different? It, it's in a number of places. Um, we, five, one of the places is 561. Why are we so different? So... Um, there's two things there. So our profile around children in care, which is where we look at where they're placed distance-wise, um, it is fair to say, yes, we, we share a sort of profile with, and similar with a number of other London boroughs where we potentially have a lower or smaller proportion of children in care placed within our borough boundary, but the vast majority are placed then within ideally 20 mile radius of their previous um, home address. One of the challenges with that is we will, must always go with the most appropriate and placement for that child and sometimes it is a long way from their home. The other measure is about children in need plans where we're saying we're a massive outlier. And what that is around and what we discussed at the previous um, scrutiny around that was unlike something like child protection or children in care, where there is a very, very clear sort of statutory framework around that. 
children in need, which is the first sort of, if, if it was sort of a hierarchy of, of sort of need once you've hit a statutory threshold for social care intervention, children in need is the lowest end of that, of that threshold. And it is a consent-based model. Um, the children in need cohort, in terms of who does and doesn't enter that cohort, our definition of it, is it's different in different authorities. So one of our sort of um, things that we've got here in Greenwich is we have a very, very strong, um, what you would know as early help, what we call our family and adolescent support service. So the sort of targeted support, but it hasn't quite meet the statutory threshold for social care intervention. Our offer is exceptionally strong and our thresholds for that service are much higher than some neighboring boroughs. So we will have families that can work really successfully with our FAST early help service that never have to tip into a statutory threshold. Whereas if another borough has a different approach to early help, which might be much more sort of universal um, and not able to perhaps, or they don't, they're not managed that they have so much targeted support within their early help, they are more likely to potentially have those children on a child in need plan. Um, no. Sorry, that's no, where it, I talk it, about it. It wasn't outliers. because I didn't know what CIN stood oh, sorry, for. Oh, sorry, I, I wondered apologies. whether it did actually relate to this extremely high figure of 22.9%, okay, okay, so yeah, yeah, where yeah. the London norm so, is 16%. Okay, can I, can I try and explain? They're completely different uh, factors. Yeah. So, child in need is a child yeah. that's not in care at all. And our numbers oh, per. So, sorry, I really. Really, really, uh, my question is absolutely not about children right. in need. Okay. I wondered whether CIN no. was referred to this particular yeah. line. No. It clearly doesn't. Okay. I'm asking about this line. Okay. Yeah. Um, what, the, what, <laughs> you so you the kind of, of mentioned children... it at the beginning, but okay. this is very different. We're very different from the rest of London, and that's what I don't understand. Yeah, so we have, yeah, we have about 23% of our children that are within that sort of boundary, and London is, 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 is 16 lower in terms 9. of the number that go out. And some of, yeah, I suppose some of the, the challenges, and it probably reflects with one of the next items around our approach to sort of placement sufficiency and our strategy around trying to increase the number of foster carers that are local and within the boroughs. It, it has been a challenge for, for Greenwich for, for a period that is, is with another, a number of other local authorities around the availability of suitable placement. Sometimes the suitable placement is not within the borough or within the immediate um, boundary. So it is, it is a measure that we have started to make progress on in terms of keeping a bigger proportion of children closer to Greenwich, if not in Greenwich. But we acknowledge it is a measure where we're still an outlier. I think what I can maybe look at is the spread across London, because what you've got in London is some real extremes of some boroughs that have got very low numbers, and then some that have got even higher numbers than us. And the, me the sort of I prefer a median rather than an average, but the DfE go with averages. The average sort of comes somewhere out in the wash where it does get sometimes skewed by those, by those sort of... Um, but, yeah, it, it is a measure we're aware of and we track because our aspiration is to keep children as close to their previous address where it's safe to do so. Yeah, of course, and, I get that. Even if they are far further away, they receive exactly the same service from the virtual school and our social workers. And in our recent Ofsted... Uh, we ha were judged as outstanding for our children in care and our care leavers and the care that we give them no matter where they live in the country. Thanks, Joe. Th thank you. Um, so... Yes. No. One question, Chair. It's not quite relevant on your performance the last quarter, but it's a question of things which has happened the last couple of days. It's a question of young offenders, and it's just possible that we have some young offenders in the borough who've been released from custody in the last couple of days. We haven't. Only adults. Only adults. There's no children at all. It's absolutely just adults. Who's been released. Yes. Okay, well, that's the answer. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report, made interesting reading, and you've answered, partly answered the question I was going to ask, but I'm, I'm coming back to um, the number of um, children who are neat, um, and looking at the, the statistics there, where uh, we know it's more, mainly more boys than girls, um, but the number of white young males that are 
neat at the moment, and also the geographical areas in which they seem to be living. And I'm just wondering what strategies, if any, we can come up with to, to try and improve that. I know, Florence, you've already spoken about the, um, yeah, <laughs> exactly, the vulnerable learners and bringing sort of um, the careers in under the um, SEN uh, umbrella. But I'm just wondering, is there anything else that we can be doing to try to identify them earlier on in school so that perhaps we can get more in place to prevent them from becoming neat? I, I think you've just hit the nail on the head really there, that the identification and the earliest identification, uh, the wellbeing in schools hubs that we're, we're launching will really help us with that because attendance is an indicator of them not being engaging in future education and training. So rolling out the wellbeing hubs in our schools, in eight schools across the borough, and having that clear focus on attendance will help. There's a couple of parts about this whole uh, numerical process. There's an early identification, there's a tracking of those young people, and it's quite a cumbersome process, and then there's the support that's given to them. So we are looking at it all again, it is an area that I think we're not as strong as some other parts of the directorate. So we're, we're looking at that, and perhaps when we have the SEND uh, item here, we can also include uh, vulnerable learners and need a uh, bit more detail to that. But I think the very early prevention, very early identification, the robust tracking and identifying all those young people. Sometimes we don't know where they are or who they are. We just ha if we haven't got a number, of, and, uh, either they're in nothing or they're in a school or um, in a college or work, we then have to mark them as an unknown and that impacts on the figures as well. Yeah, uh, yeah. and the only thing I'd add to that, one of the things that we are strong on is our unknowns are a lot lower. So whilst we might say 3.8% neat or unknown is not a figure we'd like it to be lower, what we can at least confidently say is we are better than some in terms of we know the status of more children. There's some, some boroughs, that 3.8 might be 3% unknown. They literally have no idea. And you can normally assume if you have no idea, they're very likely to be neat. I think one of the other challenges, and again, it's the sort of thing with, a, I think, the change of the service and the reinvigoration and the sort of the interconnectivity with our vulnerable learners is um, we are part of a sort of a southeast um, sort of London, because all of London is sort of chunked up around this, because, again, one of the challenges here is this measure sets out our residents. So our sort of duty is around our 16 and 17 year old children in, in Greenwich. Many of those children will not have been our pupils. So if they've never had a reason to cross our threshold because they've never triggered even FAS intervention, they've never triggered, triggered social care intervention, they may have had some attendance issues, but they've been dealt with at the school. Or Sometimes the first we might know of these young people is when they choose not to stay on to sixth form, say, in a Lewisham school, and they kind of sort of, so it is a challenge in the system, and I think and some of the strength of the sort of, the, uh, the sort of pan London and sort of local arrangements is around trying to grapple some of those shared about, we, we, can, we can control what our schools do in a way like our, our, new, our new sort of hubs project and what our schools do, and we know attendance monitoring is really strong in Greenwich schools, it is a strength. Um, it's challenging sometimes when we do in essence, inherit children that have perhaps been in other systems and how the system overall works better. So it shouldn't matter where that child goes to school. They get the same level of, of support. They are residents. Unfortunately, a lot of our measures are our pupils and we can sit here with much more clarity and go, we do this, this and this. Sometimes when it's our residents, we don't have that full lens because unless we have a reason to engage with them. Yeah. I'll do my microphone. Thank you very much. That was really good. We're going to move now on to item five, which is the update on the impact of the new sufficiency strategy. Thank you, David. So, welcome, David. And um, I'm going to hand over to you to give us a, a sort of whistle stop, if you don't mind. Um, assume we've read it, but you know, you pick out your favourite bits. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll give a kind of general overview um, on it. So, in terms of our sufficiency strategy, it's, it's partly a kind of legal responsibility that we have, but essentially it sets out 
what we're doing to ensure that we've got high quality, sufficient homes for our children in care. And by homes, I don't just mean residential homes, I mean foster carers, I mean supported accommodation, so the broadest sense. So the strategy kind of sets out all of the different work, and as you can see, there's kind of a lot of stuff that, that goes on in the area. So um, what we have done, partly it's informed through kind of feedback from our Children in Care Council, is kind of set out our ambitions um, of what we want in this area. And that ranges from our kind of first ambition, which is actually the early on, you know, it's best if we can get in early, do the prevention work, so actually children don't even need to kind of come into care, to the when children do have to come into care, actually how can we ensure that we have really high quality internal fostering, Greenwich foster carers to, to support those children and that everyone here will know about the kind of various different work that we do around recruitment of our foster carers, etc. Then going on to the, obviously in uh, not all cases, can internal foster carers meet the need of the children? So we do have to go to independent fostering agencies and also residential homes, sports accommodation. So how do we ensure that we have the kind of best provision needed where that, that is the case. And then finally, our fourth ambition is looking at that kind of older age range, so young people, 16 to 17 year old, and kind of that transition into to adulthood, if you will, and kind of what work we're doing there. A lot of that often does focus as well on supported accommodation, because that tends to be the kind of um, accommodation that you would get in terms of that age range. So the report 4.66 sets out some of the kind of work that's, that's been done to date. And then the kind of strategy itself sets out, alongside those ambitions, kind of the different things that are going on. And I guess what, you know, and this will probably come out in the discussion, is kind of a really uh, key challenge in this area. Um, people might have seen this, it's often in the news, is around the, the market for this area. It's very dysfunctional. Um, you have numerous reports, Ofsted, Department for Education, Competitions and Markets Authority have all reviewed this area, um, and it, it doesn't work well. Right? Um, and so lots of this is about, well, how do we address that? And so things like opening up our own provision is one way of that. Things like working with our colleagues in other London authorities is a critical part of this. We, we can't kind of do it alone. Um, but it's, it's, it is a real challenge, you know, there's no getting away from this. To give, I suppose, a bit of a sense um, around some of this, on average, a kind of independent fostering agency, the average cost is probably about £1,000 a week, roughly. Um, when you're looking at a residential home, it's probably about £5,600 kind of a week, um, and then supported accommodation, roughly about £2,000 a week. Obviously, that can fluctuate very differently, and particularly when you're talking about small numbers, you can have kind of individual cases which really skew it. So it's not uncommon that if there is a young person and they have very significant needs, it could be to do with disabilities, it could be to do with uh, a combination of sexual exploitation, criminal exploitation, uh, it's not unusual to have placement offers in the range of fifteen to £20,000 a week. Um, so this, this is really an area where we know as, uh, as a country, I suppose, we need to do more. We, we absolutely need to do more in this area. So this kind of sets out all of those different things that, that we're doing to, to kind of tackle that um, and really to provide the best kind of placements that, that we can for our children. And I think, you know, this is obviously one of the things that Ofsted were looking at when they came in. Um, but it's, it's an absolute priority for us. It's why we talk about our corporate parenting so much. It's why we have a partnership corporate parenting strategy. And this, this strategy itself is about how we deliver the best homes for, for our children. So happy to take any questions. Th thanks very much, David. And just, just from the chair, um, I did read the ambitions and, and felt that that's exactly what the ambitions were, very ambitious. And... Um, you know, against the climate, it's not easy. But I would like to add the caveat that we have got the ARC, which is successfully opened. And um, just to add as an aside, I'm sorry, I didn't make the barbecue. Um, that was the day I had the eye done, so <laughs> I didn't make it. Uh, but I'd like some feedback on that. And maybe perhaps particularly for our new panel, any new panel members, you could say a little bit about the ARC, which is A-A-R-R-C, um, and, you know, 
when that opened and what it was doing before we move on to questions. Thanks. So the AARRC, Adolescent Assessment and Resource Centre, is a, a new children's home that we opened last year uh, down uh, towards Abbey Wood. It had previously been empty for some while. I think it's been used for all sorts of different things. But uh, they uh, have been hugely successful at holding some very difficult and very complex children there. Their barbecue last week uh, was wonderful. The staff commitment to those children and the love that you could just feel in, in that space was, uh, was wonderful. Um, it complements Broadwalk, which is our other children's home uh, closer to Woolwich, and uh, another facility that we are just going through the Ofsted registration, which is the independent pod. So in the grounds of Broadwalk, but it is a separate unit for young people who've lived at Broadwalk to then move into independence and get that taste of living independently in a, in a safe way with staff and people still around. We're also in the process as part of the MTFS proposals of working to open another children's home. Um, this is partly to ensure that the quality of our children's homes is uh, of a very high level. They have clinical support from Oxleys and our own clinicians supporting them as, very, as well as very highly skilled staff. But it's also to uh, meet the challenge of the increasing cost of residential placements that's run by private organisations that are profit-making organisations and making profit from vulnerable children. And we really don't want to see that. So we are committed to trying to build our own and uh, residential provision, but ensuring we also have a really good quality foster carers because the foster carers who might be our foster carers don't necessarily all live in Greenwich. Some of them live in other parts of, of the country, but they uh, are not through an agency. And when it's through an agency, we have to also pay the agency as well as the foster care. So that's also more expensive. Um, so yes, the ARC, if anybody wants to visit any of the children's homes, please do let us know and we can arrange that. Thanks so much, Florence. And I think you'll be overrun with people wanting to visit now. Now, can I open up to questions, please, from the panel on this item? Question again, really, on the ambitions, which uh, the chair's already said, they're excellent. But um, what's happening, we're hopeful, is that in the coming year or so, there will be perhaps a little bit more money available to local authorities with the change which has come. It's been promised. I'm not saying that there's, the answer's not there tonight, but it's really a proposal to you. Would it be helpful, I think, if we could begin to cost these a bit more in more detail, so that when revised budgets are being prepared for the Royal Borough, we could say, now, these are ambitions, these are the costs. If the extra money comes in, please can we have um, money for these particular items, rather than just have a general, can we have a bit more money? I think we've got, if we can be specific and show what we've looked for and how we've costed them, I think it might be helpful. So I would say that for um, many of the things that's out here, there has been additional investment with the development of the kinship team or others. Mm -hmm. Some of these things are things that it's not necessarily about a kind of monetary investment, but it's about how we do things together. So some of the panel arrangements, for example, mm -hmm. um, it's, I mean, it's a resources thing when you count time of people around the table. And so bringing mm -hmm. together, uh, let's say, CAMS colleagues, through care colleagues, health colleagues, various others. But it's not necessarily a kind of uh, investment of a kind of additional money. So what I would say is that there has been um, there has been additional uh, money gone in some of these areas. But, yeah. Um, so there has been some additional investment um, as a growth last year on the kinship teams, which is about trying to help families stay together and finding kinship carers, so uh, special guardians and other kinship carers. However there's also significant savings. And I think that uh, at the moment it's so unknown as to whether actually there'll be any budget increase at all. And if there is, the pressure on the local authorities for adult social care, for temporary accommodation and children's social care is so great. And I don't know, Adele, if you want to say anything about this, but it's so large that I don't think we will uh, 
receive much more money for children's social care apart from our natural sort of demand in inflation and growth. So there'll, there'll be that that comes along, but I don't think there'll be additional. I think it's more, as Dave was saying, our ways of working and our thinking strategically ahead about our own foster carers, our own res residential provision, and ensuring that uh, the very best work we can do at the earliest possible stage to prevent children coming into care. Thank you. Thank you for this uh, report. I actually think this is an amazing um, strategy, actually, by the way. Um, I guess the question I have was more to do with the placement mechanism and trying to understand not only the negotiation process, but as Adele has actually just highlighted, savings. So by the, the council having their own sort of placement resource, that essentially would be a better model for us? Right, okay. been working with housing to try and look at options of moving the whole family uh, outside of the area because there's a lot of um, harm outside of the home and under our assistant our deputy director for children's social care has been working with the assistant director in housing to look at options and ways of being able to move the family to another to outside of the, the borough and we think that that's going to be successful um, you can imagine what saving that will make so it's not just about provision and i think the strategy and i agree in dave and the team work very hard on this strategy that it isn't just about places it's a whole ways of working um together and and across directorates as well okay. do you want to say something yeah i suppose i just want to add we we will probably always have an element of reliance on external placements. So we will never be able to probably have enough. And some of that is because actually in some instances, the needs of the children mean that actually being placed further away from the borough is better for, for their needs, given the circumstances, potential criminal exploitation, various different things. Um, so we're always gonna have a slight reliance on that, which puts the onus on, we, we need to always make sure that our negotiation of placements is as good as it can be. So we're always looking at kind of ways in which we can improve that. Um, we're looking at how we better benchmark costs as well, because some of it is really, when we're having those discussions with providers, really drilling down, when they're giving us a price, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, if you're saying it's costing this much, how much is staffing? What are you kind of delivering for that? And in doing so, what you can then do is work down the price so it's therefore more kind of in line with what is actually being provided um, but it's very challenging in the sense that you have a provider let's say you've got a provider and they have I don't know 50 foster carers they're potentially receiving 100 referrals a day and so you're left in a position where in that regard it is a provider's market so you you what you need to try and do is you negotiate you have the relationship there it's that balance because and in some instances this happens you negotiate and they say you know what no we're all right we can go and charge this other local authority that amount because they won't negotiate they won't bring us down so we'll just go and take that placement so that's the kind of constant thing that we're always working on how we can kind of improve um and that's the kind of environment that that we're in really just to bring it to life a little bit social workers don't do that negotiation there's a whole personalized commissioning team that's in dave's service so one of our divisions that Dave leads is our commissioning division, which is an integrated post between health 
and children's uh, services. Um, that gives us a lot of opportunities about working across with health as well. But there's a personalised commissioning team and they do all the negotiation and they do all the, the placement findings. So the social workers concentrate on the needs of the child and the family. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> my question is really, it's regarding outside providers. Um, I have become aware, and I'm actually going to have to sort of get in touch with someone uh, of within my ward, and apparently they are grow, sort of, you know, di coming up in other areas, um, properties that are sold and, um, yes, you know, that they put in sort of... Um, units, a kitchen, uh, a kitchen, and then bedrooms and ensuites and everything for and that a care home, call it a care home. But they then set, this particular one has set up. This is where I think it, sometimes it's working with planning because, you know, sort of if they go to, if, if we know they haven't been to planning, um, it's relying on the public and it's also sometimes relying on councillors ourselves. And I know that apparently there are quite, these places are increasing where they just have, say, one or two or three children. They take them with se severe needs for a period of time to try and, and do assessments on them. But this particular one I'm talking about hasn't, I am sure, been monitored and hasn't had the, the, the sufficient progress process hasn't been gone through. I think that this is illegal, and I'm sure that this must happen, and I don't know how you can sort of watch it, really, just by... Uh, start. But it we is... Watch it all the time. We watch sorry, it all I'm not sure where that... So, is. very, very quickly, we watch it all the time. Every single children's home has to be registered with Ofsted. If it's a change of planning use, it always comes to us. It comes to Dave's team. We do a report back. If there's any children's home that you think is operating illegally, tell Dave and we'll look at the registration of Ofsted. If they are operating illegally, we'll report it to Ofsted. So there's a huge monitoring process around children's homes and there shouldn't be any that are unregistered or unmonitored. And Dave's team also... No, no. Dave's team also do very robust quality assurance on the ones we do know. Now, there are children's homes that our children aren't placed in there was a big report done some years ago, uh, a couple of years ago now, that many of the children's homes in London actually have children from outside of London living in them. Um, so we might not know about every single children's home, but if you're, you're suspicious or think that there's something going on, we can do checks on that. There's a register. Thank you, Councillor Greenwell. I think, you know, if that's casework, then you can raise that. Thank you. Um, yes, Joe. Thank you, Chair. My, my question sort of follows on and it, it, a part of Councillor Ayadella's question. Um, my when I first looked at this, I really so pleased to see that we're doing this in-house provision for, for all the reasons that you've both said. I think that's marvellous. And I was going to ask a very simplistic question, and of course it won't be simplistic, uh, which is how much does it cost for each child in you know, how much is it literally costing us having a, them there now of course there's such a range of needs we've talked about from a couple of thousand to twenty five thousand and i don't know where each child sits on that but i'm trying to get a feel for what you you know a it will be better provision but b as we say it will be we're, we're not putting money in someone else's pockets so what how much are we saving i suppose is almost my question roughly <laughs> Is this in terms of in-house provision, the costs? The, 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 uh, I'm talking about ARC yeah. um, as against... I'm talking about residential yeah. specifically. So we, we did do an analysis of this, and it's all went into the last year's MTFS, so the different costs. It does range. I think we average about 10,000. It ranges from about seven to 25,000 in-house. I can't remember exactly off the top of my head, but we've got all that data we could do a follow-up uh, note to you all if you would like that data. We do have it. 
Yeah, I suppose. Yeah, I can't remember the figures off the top yeah, of my head. No, no, I wouldn't necessarily yeah. expect you to. But and I'm for, it's terrible to be ha having to speak about money when we're talking about children's lives. I get, get that, but we are because we have got limited amounts of money. Um, so I suppose what well, the real thing is, if it's costing us ten thousand for child A in Ark in our own place, if we had to place that child elsewhere, what would it cost us? Yeah, we, we can get that because we, in terms of the modelling for the bit, well, the business case in a sense for creating the arc, we were we were kind of working that out um, around what the difference is. So yeah, we can. Does that help, Joe? That answers the question. Good, good. Right, uh, Callum. Hi. So I was going to ask the exact same uh, question as Joe about the estimated cost saving from that moving to in-house. So thank you very much. And related to that. Um, and I, again, this could kind of follow on alongside that, just what the increase in our in-house capacity is from some of that new provision that has come online in the last year and that is planned going forward. Again, rather than having to sort of desperately search, we can just follow up with that, that's, that's fine. Um, and also just, uh, on, uh, just on your answer, sort of what, what you were breaching for before, were you saying on the numbers of between sort of 10 and 25 is that per week or per per week because you know i know you mentioned the 125k per week you know that's like 1.3 million a year so that is a uh, you know the, the the amount that we can be doing for the rest of kids in the borough there as well is um and, and so thank you very much for also seeking to unlock that as well with some of the that interagency c work so I've got them uh, basically every three months from um, from my, this March back to actually 2017. Um, so if you count, for example, in, um, let's take, uh, we were in the end of March 2019, we had 134 um, RBG foster placements. Um, and 102 of them were kind of career carers, 32 were kind of friends and family. Then moving on to this March 2024, we had 183 RBG foster carers, um, and of that we had 127 career carers. So we, we have seen, there's been a lot of work in recruitment, and um, people, I'm sure everyone would have seen, certainly I saw when receiving the council tax, that leaflet that came through around advertising, that did, increase uh, the kind of call-ins for that. Um, what I would say, and I think I've made this pitch before, it is an ongoing thing, recruiting. You know, the minute you stop doing it, you know, it drops off. Yeah. So I guess my plea for everyone is, whoever you talk to, just ask them if they want to be a foster carer for RBG um, and see if we can get them in because we, we just always have to get them in, particularly if anyone likes uh, looking after teenagers um, because that is a particular area where um, we, we really do need the capacity. And the ARC has given us six extra places and that might, might not sound a lot but actually children in residential care is about 40? 50, 50, 60. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Our foster carers for Greenwich, not agency. Could you say that with a louder voice, please, Lawrence? We need to get it out there. <laughs> I, I mean, it's recognised the difficulty in recruiting, and I, I have to say here, having sat in this panel for quite some time, that I think um, our officers are doing a phenomenal job uh, in what is, I feel, a cold climate sometimes. Um, albeit, we've got to do more. But, you know, thank you for the work you're doing. Um, and I can't see any more questions. I just want to say thank you for that report and, and all those details. And we look forward to seeing the development. Thanks, Dave. Thank you. So we're moving on to item six now. The independent review of children with special educational needs and, and SEND and disability. Is this I'm, you, Florence? Yeah. I'm afraid it is because um, Jodie's unable to be here or under. So... I'll just give you a broad outline and I'll try and take um, answers, but it's a technical area. So these are our children, it's on the theme of residential provisionary. These are our children with the most complex special education needs and disabilities. 
And in 2022, and you might recall this, there was widespread abuse of children with special education needs placed in three independent residential settings in the, in the north, um, operating under one group called the Hesley Group. And there was a national review. So there's a national uh, safeguarding practice review panel, uh, and there's a national review focusing on these children with disabilities and how it came to be that they had been so neglected and abused in residential provision. So phase two looked at that, uh, the needs of those children who are in registered children's homes. And the second phase of that called for all local authorities to undertake a review of their activity and their placements, which we did. Um, we found that there were no widespread or any systemic concerns of our children placed in, in our settings. But we decided that we were going to do another phase two report, uh, looking at the recommendations, looking at kind of all of our vulnerable children in SEND residential settings that, um, so we, could, we commissioned an extended review to look at those. And uh, the task and finish group still meets, they still have a lens on those children to make sure that there's good quality assurance, there are no failings in our provision. Um, you might have also read that there is another uh, children's home in Kent that's run by Wandsworth Council that there's been some concerns about the administration of medication and the provision there. And we have had one child there and where we know there's a child, Dave's team, uh, we either move them or make sure we've got wraparound support. And so we are very robust in the quality assurance and the reviewing and we have had an independent review of our, our work. So this report just really outlines that work, uh, outlines the uh, task and finish group and uh, who's chaired by Jodie Mathers and has got good representation across the partnership, the safeguarding partnership and our ICB. And that will continue and continue to report to the safeguarding partnership and scrutiny as, uh, as you might want to. Um, so really the report just asks for the endorsement and the uh, acknowledgement of the recommendations that we're asking, uh, that we're making. Um, so I'll leave it there and take any questions that I can try and respond to. Dave, you That's might. great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Florence. Yeah. Um, and can I just say that this is a, 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 gr a good piece of work, mm. great piece mm. of work um, for such a vulnerable group, a really vulnerable group mm. of children and young people. Um, and I think it takes, we, we need to acknowledge as a panel that it does take um, some confidence to open up to an independent review. Mm. Um, but just to speak from, from the chair really, um, under the recommendations, um, when, it, when you read things like social workers and their managers to regularly read the regulation 44, I, I mean, some of these recommendations that you assumed were going on anyway, uh, social workers across the department to be trained on how to work and engage with disabled children. I mean, one's, one's assuming that that is what social workers are actually doing. I mean, uh, the recommendations are saying that our social workers should be trained to engage. I mean. Um, can, we, can we not say that they are trained, or would you like to comment on that? I don't know. Or can you not? I'm just trying to find... Sorry, I'm on page 75 of the pack, oh, but um, that's not you, is it? It's just the report. Uh, the public report. So I've got different papers in front of me. 410. Four, four, on the... Um, What's this bit? It's 4.10. Yeah. Um, but that's not. So, Regulation 44 reports are the reports of the children's home. They're not our reports. And so, I think it's saying that we must. Re so, the Regulation 44 reports are the kind of. It, report that happens before an inspection happens. So children's homes are inspected yearly. And the Reg 44 report is the pre-report that each children's home does. So it's not about individual children, it's about the whole home. So what the recommendation is, is that the social workers, even if it's not about their own child, read that report regularly. So I think it's trying to not make an assumption that they're already read and to put it clearly in place that 
social workers and their managers must read those Reg 44 reports and ask for them because they're not automatically given because it's not part of your casework. So it, it's, that's the, the wording around it. But I, I take your point, Linda, about the way you would expect them always to do that, but I think it's in giving a robust, active action to it. Mm. Number six, okay. So this is across the department. So not all of our social workers do work with disabled children. There are many that don't and haven't done, but it's trying to ensure that we, across not just the children with disabilities team, but all of the teams, and there's a lot of so 400 social workers nearly, um, that they all are trained on how to work and engage with disabled children, not just the specialist teams. Mm. I take that point, yeah. um, and the words across the department are important. And, you know, wearing, wearing a hat of 20 odd years ago when I was a head teacher, and we were all trained in um, inclusion um, for, for, our, for our children with SEND needs, you know. Uh, so I take the point, I didn't pick up across the department, so that makes it slightly less alarming. Yeah. Um, opening up for questions, Callum. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. So I've got a couple of general questions. I had a few more specific questions about the restricted report, but rather than us go into a closed session for that, perhaps it's best for me to follow up by email, uh, and then also it can be answered by people who are sort of more in the, the depths of um, the report. So apologies, kind of three questions here. I'll ask one at a time because that'll probably be a bit easier. Um, so I think one of the key things that this highlights both the... Yeah, what's detailed in the public part of the report here and the national report is about the importance of coordination. Um, now, when it comes to send children not in care as well, one of the things that parents often report is about frustration of having to basically repeatedly explain the problem to every single provider and just going around in circles. Um, and, you know, it's, it's heartening that the report highlights a uh, focus on trying to get more coordinated. Um, but essentially, what is it that we are looking to do to ensure that more holistic and joined up provision? Is that through CAMS? Is it through MASH? Um, and you know, I think it's a particular concern because on some of the national data about children with SEND provision in residential care, there's a real spike in what they kind of term stress-related, which is sort of mental health and psychosomatic um, challenges for girls, particularly around 11 to 14. Um, and it's just making sure that we're properly joined up between the education and the health side. Because while um, EHCP has health in it, they're much more education than health plans. So my question there is just what are we able to, to do to ensure that more holistic approach um, with that coordination? Partly Dave's role as an integrated commissioner of both health and uh, RBG is one part. We have a SEND improvement board that is made up of health, education and social care. It's a very robust board with high level uh, for our SEND strategy. Um, the, the points about girls are absolutely right and the joined up um, across the EHCP and that was one of the strengths in our Ofsted and CQC inspection last year was that our partnership works very well together and uh, it's not just about processing children through an EHCP, it's about our partners working together and getting the right support. So we have a very strong integrated commissioning uh, service and um, option in, in Greenwich that brings together the therapies of speech and language therapy, uh, occupational therapy, and the, some of the paediatric support. We also have an increasing closer working relationship with Oxleys and CAMS. We now have an integrated clinical team within the directorate that works across our whole directorate of children who are open to us can access that CAMS support if we identify that it's needed, and that's really going to help us. That's just very new, that's just started. So I think the join up between education and health is good. Um, these are children that with particular, very high level of complex needs, um, 
that sort of many of our children with SEND won't have, they'll be in mainstream schools, but they still need that join up across those services. So I am confident that we've got good working relationships and robust sort of strategic boards and panels and commissioning processes in place to bring that join up together. Um, does that answer your question enough? Yes, that, so, that's it. You you're the lead on the commissioning of that. And, um. Yeah, I suppose part of it is that kind of how we can better facilitate. So an example might be um, if, and this kind of comes back to the point earlier around the um, support around working with children with disabilities. On a general universal level, yes, all social workers will have that. But when you get to slightly more complex needs where you're having to navigate potentially a child in crisis, that kind of uh, relationship between the hospital, between CAMS, between social care, educational, that's when it can get quite complex. And actually, if you don't deal with that kind of for the majority of your caseload, for the majority of the time, that, that can be quite daunting. You know, you're, you're in a room full of consultants, psychiatrists, you know, that, that environment might feel a bit alien. So it's, it's supporting social workers as well in part as to how to navigate that system. Because um, I suppose bearing in mind, we do a lot of work locally and we have really strong relationships with Lewisham Greenwich Trust, with Oxleys, with others. And that means that in terms of uh, when children are local, we're doing a lot of active support, we've got those relationships. But of course, not all children, particularly with very complex needs, are always local. They might be in another part of the country, and then you're talking about a different CAM service. You're potentially talking about a different hospital. So actually, if we can support social workers in navigating not just local health systems, but the broader health system, then it enables them to have much more joined up discussions. And you know, it's, it's hard enough sometimes for any of us to navigate kind of the health world, let's say, so um, it's no different sometimes when you're a social worker. So part of what we also try and do is support them in that so that they can better support families and better support that child in trying to bring it together. Because um, sometimes obviously professionals can speak past each other and actually it, it, there's a thing around how do you connect people so everyone's kind of contributing to one plan. But the vast majority of our children on the EHCPs don't have a social worker. So it's only those children with either the parents aren't coping or very complex needs that needs an additional social care input as well. But many of our families uh, don't need a, a social worker as well and they navigate in a different way. And there's always more we can do to help that navigation and help those relationships. Yeah. Cheers, thank you. I, mean, I think it's because it's particularly concerned because when it comes to children with STEM provision who are in our residential care, that's all on us, you know? It's, they aren't going to have the parent who's able to go there and, and battle through some of the bureaucracies. We've got to do that while still being part of the <laughs> bureaucracies as well. Um, but thank you, that was, that was very helpful. Um, they have very complex needs. They will be paid for by health and we will pay for the education, but they don't have a social worker. So there are some that are, uh, are, there are they are our responsibility, and we will say it, but their parents are very active and they're not in, actually in our care. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I guess my other, other question around this is, um, in particular around transition points, there are kind of two kind of dangerous transition point, so to speak, and that's often the sh you know, when one exits, when a child exits paediatric care, goes into quite a different system, and then also when they become an adult. And so there's a second question, so A, on those transition points, and then second, linked to that, around what are we doing to help train some of these um, children in care with SEND provision for independence? So. Are we connecting up with local businesses, apprenticeships, and so on? Um, and what safeguarding measures are we working to make sure are in place, both in terms of the welfare of those children and young people, um, and also to make sure that they receive a comprehensive and authentic experience as well? I'm not sure I quite understood the first, the transition to paediatric care. Sorry, out of paediatric, when you go from, you know... Oh, to adulthood. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So um, we've done a huge amount of work looking at our transitions because transitions used to t take place in three different places. There were sort of uh, under 18, 
18 to 25 and then onwards. And the work we've done is brought all of the um, whole process up to 25 into children's services rather than being in adult services. So that's helped with the pathway and the planning much, much earlier on in a child's life at 14 into adulthood. That includes uh, a lot of work about preparing for independence. Uh, we are growing our supported internships. So for those people, children growing up into adulthood, we w can uh, go into an internship that is very, very highly supported, that gives them the skills into their future adulthood. So um, I, we could do a whole session on transition to adulthood. And I think, again, when we bring the SCND, that's another component part of it. And Jodie Mathers, who leads this service, has also led the work on transition to adulthood. And it's about us identifying them early on and making sure that we've got the communication with adult services, but doing that transition work starting at 14 year olds, but not having many, many different cliff edges and not having many changes of professionals. So those professionals carry on working with them to 25, whereas previously there would be a change of social worker at uh, the, the uh, transition phase and then another cliff edge as well. Perfect, thank you. And so very quickly, last thing, and I'll, I'll send my other questions on to Jodie and I can copy you as well. One of the specific recommendations mentioned in 4.10 is the last one is about multi-agency learning event. Has that happened yet or is that planned? And if so, do we know when that's going to happen um, as well? So the... Uh, this paper and all the work has been presented to the, to the Greenwich Children's Safeguarding Partnership, which is multi-agency, but we haven't yet done the whole learning event. We look forward to hearing about that, Florence. That would be, that'd be really good. Uh, do we have any more questions? So I think, I think Dave wanted to come in on something. I was just going to pick up on the point around you mentioned around employment businesses, and that's a really key part. So... Um, we have supported internships working with different businesses, so um, Barclay Homes, um, I want to say Brighter Horizons, I was getting some other one, and Lewisham and Greenwich Trust, um, where, and we're, we're looking at expanding that further, obviously as a council as well, we're looking at um, developing our own programme where we have young people who have uh, an education for care plan and are provided with a range of different placements, provided with a kind of lot of support in this. Um, and so you have, for example, some of our young people who are working in Queen Elizabeth Hospital doing portering, working in the cafe, working in the reception front of house for Buckley Homes, all that kind of thing. So um, we have a number of placements there, which, and the intention of that is they also get support around then, okay, they do the support internship, but then going into employment. So we have those support internships in place, but what we're looking to do is expand the number of organisations that deliver them locally so we have even more opportunities for young people to go into them. Perfect, thank you. And uh, I won't ask you to answer uh, sort of how many children who've, with that provision who are in our care have come through that, given it's a small number and you wouldn't want to risk identifying anybody, but just they would all be eligible for that, and if met the, the appropriate conditions, would receive exactly the same. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's the same condition of the education of care plan. Um, it, obviously, there are elements around being able to independently travel to a degree because they need to get to placement. Um, but assuming they meet kind of basic closure rate requirements, then yeah, absolutely available. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dave, again. That's, that's great. We can, no more questions. Yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't go far. <laughs> so we can move on to, really, um, yeah, that's it. Um, so we're really moving on now on to the next item, which is really the Children's um, Centre's consultation document. Um, now, this is uh, an item, obviously, for discussion. Um, I just want to say from, from the chair, really, um, that the Royal Borough of Greenwich, for many years, has been a flagship, or is a flagship um, borough in terms of um, preschool provision and in terms of acknowledging those first 
100 days as being crucial in a child's development and family support and um, in taking the Every Child Matters agenda forward. And, you know, it has to be said that when uh, government funding pulled out Sure Start, Greenwich didn't. And, you know, we stuck. And I want to sing out for Greenwich Home Start or Home Start Greenwich, whichever way you want to say it, um, as being something that I will protect whilst I still breathe. So any cuts or any strategic um, alteration to our children's centres, I think everyone in this room feels um, a personal attachment to. So um, we, we acknowledge, everybody acknowledges that there has to be change. Um, you know, we've got to provide the best possible support for our families, and that isn't always necessary to keep the same old, same old. But we've got to also keep those underlying um, beliefs and those underlying um, thoughts at the base of everything we do. So any discussion that we have, or I involve myself in, will have that at its heart. And the first, first question I wanted to ask from the, from the document, when it says closing children's centre sessions, um, I think it would be good to explain what, what is meant by a children's centre session and um, what, if any, uh, what, if any, potential impact does this have, particularly on vulnerable children? So I'll hand over to you, David. <laughs> Um, so where it's got around uh, children's centre sessions no longer available in the building, um, that doesn't mean that they're all disappearing, I should say. Um, that is around the location of many of them. So looking at alternative venues, looking at community uh, spaces, some delivery. Um, so it's kind of re-looking at the majority of them are, are continuing just in, in different locations. Um, that includes things such as stay in place, for example. I think that's the one that most people tend to, to recognize it. Um, but if you kind of looked at maybe a children's center timetable, you can kind of see a lot of different activities. It doesn't include the kind of health elements. So it doesn't include like your infant feeding drop-in, uh, midwifery, appointments for example um, but does include the kind of other things so when it says the kind of no longer delivered there it's not that um, every single one of those is just going to kind of disappear overnight um, as I said the majority of them we are looking in in terms of, of other locations what I would say is and this is a key principle of how children's centres work now um, and under this proposal would continue to be the case is it, the ongoing shaping of what is delivered by the feedback that comes from parents and comes from families and and that is a kind of key principle of children's centre services so what is on the timetable let's say in terms of delivery um, is not a one-size-fits-all approach it's not a kind of static thing it shapes according to the need so actually on um, one term you might have um, you know a need for around greater support around domestic violence a program around that um, on another term, you might find actually you, you want to deliver a slightly more stay in place. And I, I guess that's, I think that's a really key thing that we should be holding on to that we, we have kept in this, that there should be always that ongoing uh, discussion with families to shape what, what is available. And that's, that's part of this proposal too. That, that, that's great. And we know there's consultation and, you know, really we can't actually delve into this report um, until the consultation's over. But um, I'm mindful of our flagship areas like Stalkways, where there are um, amazing provisions there. And one of those is, is the dads group <laughs> that I happen to know a lot about, um, which is highly successful. And you know, you would want, to, you would want that to, to sort of be maintained because when you look at the geographic, geographical outlay, some of the bus journeys and some of the journeys that people are having to make to go to the potential centres, and I know it's still consultation, some of those bus journeys are quite significant, um, and it would be even more significant if you've got a toddler and, and a baby in a pram. So, um, you know, these are the sort of things that are in my mind, and I think will be in 
hopefully in parents' minds and families' minds when they look at the consultation document. So just, I, I know. <laughs> Um, and, you know, um, I just wanted to make sure that, that we knew about that. And, and I know I don't want to take over from the chair, but um, I am mindful that we've just done um, reception intake in some of our primary schools. And some of the children coming into some of our reception classes, and I'm thinking of one school in particular, have considerable needs and, you know, are considerably, um, shall we say, vulnerable in terms of social needs and, and social adjustment and clearly would have benefited from preschool. Obviously, that's not the case. I mean, I'm not going to quote individual schools or places. So, you know, the value of what we've got, we don't want to lose, um, but we want to re realign it, is my point. So let's wait till the consultation. Yeah, really, sorry. So, a um, couple of different things. Um, so, I, I should probably declare a declaration of interest as a user of um, Storeway <laughs> with a 10 month hold. Um, so, and also uh, of kind of being uh, semi recruited to the TADS group uh, earlier on. Um, so, you know, this, this Storeway and the proposals continuing to deliver, continuing to deliver as a family hub. Um, in terms of the venues, we talk about um, journeys, obviously, in the consultation paper. The, the actual journey, what we're, we're looking uh, for feedback from people around different venues, because actually what we want is we want to be able to deliver in places closer to where people live. Um, at the moment, there are parts of the borough which don't have a kind of fixed uh, centre, and, and having uh, the kind of... Uh, investment from the, the building side does restrict some of our ability to flex on that. Um, but we do want to reduce that, that kind of distance where there's something um, that's delivered. Um, the other part in terms of the work, um, actually I should probably say as well, um, some of the provision that is delivered is funded through the Family Hubs uh, funding. That's to 75 local authority areas. Um, the funding for that at the moment does run out at the end of March uh, next year. So what I would say there is a separate to this, there's a caveat of we're still waiting to hear um, about the future for that. So things like the, the dad's group, for example, is funded from, from that. So we still do need to wait and hear, like that's completely aside from, from any of this uh, around the future there. We're, we're hopeful, but obviously until the, the it's confirmed, we don't know. Um, and then just the, the point around support, particularly in schools, around uh, communication is a really important element to this as well. Um, there is a lot of work that has taken place. Um, so there has been training to school staff around Early Talk Boost um, that has gone into virtually all of our primary schools. Um, and the evaluation for that has shown that children's early language schools uh, skills um, by, uh, have improved by five months over the course of nine weeks. So what we've seen is some of that accelerated development through programs like that and the investment of that. Recently, we've expanded that program not just to deliver to, to schools, but also to deliver to our private voluntary and independent nurseries, because uh, actually many of our children don't necessarily go to obviously school nurseries, but they're going to, to other nurseries. So we've, we've invested more in that as well. The school improvement and behavior teams also provided attachment and emotional literacy training um, going into the early years foundation stage as part of, again, supporting on, on this. Um, and there is a focus uh, at the moment on oracy in the, the primary school um, phase. So um, in June, there was the launch of a focus on this and a, a conference that was attended by 90 uh, school staffs, so we had guest speakers from Voice 21 and the Centre for Literacy and Primary Education. So I guess the, the point is there's a lot that we're trying to do in, in the early years around this, recognising things like the impact of COVID, for example. That's, you know, we know the impact that that's had on communication. Yeah, I quite agree. I mean, I don't think any of us can forget that because now we're seeing these little ones who didn't have that um, 
children's centre possibly they didn't have that out in the community and I do know of one school where you know there are um, children there I think they've got about 17 in reception that are um, children with with profound needs and some I think a good proportion of those are non-verbal um, and I don't think that's I don't think that's an isolated um, an, an isolated case I think that's quite something that we're having to face so anyway I think I'll stop now and open up for the rest of the panel who will be bored with listening to me okay Joshua thank you once again uh, one question the public consultation has that begun all oh, right cool, cool and it finishes on the October okay cool it's probably worth me promoting that on social media yeah okay cool yeah all right that's the only question for now I have another question I'll come back to that after uh it was actually the one I shared on email with the group um and it was to do with staffing how how we um I mean how do we navigate that in light of some of the changes that we're, we're going through here? Because, I, I don't know, would, would there be something that we're looking at to see how is the optimal way to make sure that we staff these children's centres moving forward? Um, just curious more. So I suppose it is worth acknowledging that, you know, any change actually, even not in these circumstances, is really difficult um, for staff. We have an amazing children's centre staff team um, we have invested really heavily in them in terms of their training and their support, um, and they do they do a brilliant job. And I, I think it's really important to to acknowledge that. Um, and and we want to keep as many as you know. We've invested them. We want to keep them in Greenwich. We want to keep them in early years. Our providers, um, many of whom are here today, have done a lot of work in terms of working with the staff groups during this this period um, and obviously you know we're going for a consultation uh, subject to any uh, decision then there could be an impact around staffing um, and so we will be working very closely with our providers through, through any of that process to, to be as supportive as possible um, to make sure that we're mitigating any impact um, on them but I suppose it is just worth acknowledging as, as I say any any change process is is really challenging uh, for staff but we as I say, we have a great children's centre style workforce and we really want to retain as many people locally in, the, in Greenwich. Thanks. Um, I'm, I'm looking at the maps, current and new, and I'm looking at the sort of suggestions for, you know, the current children's centres. And there's one thing I can't quite find on the map. I'm looking particularly at Charlton, which is the um, area that I... And it's saying for some of the Charlton stuff, um, what's proposed, and it's saying that um, other services close by. It's talking about a new family centre in Charlton. And I can't see that on, is it me? I can't see this on the map. And when is it going to open if it's not in existence yet? So there are, Currently, uh, discussions going on um, between Charlton Triangle and Children's Centre Providers around getting the site ready. Um, we can, I think we have circulated around the address, and I can't remember it off the top of my head, um, but my colleagues might be able to provide it. But um, shortly is the answer in terms of, I don't have the specific date at the moment, but shortly. Is, is that thing going to be at, in the cherry orchard. I know that Charlton yeah. Triangle are talking about something, and I think Quaggy are going to be. Yeah. Okay. That's okay. It. So I've, I've joined up some dots. Thank you. Okay. Um, just sort of uh, for discussion, really. Um, we say, quote, we want to make sure our send services are local and personalized to families. But looking through all the various centers, and obviously where closures are going to take place, and one, yes, this is a little bit sort of really agreeing with what Linda, the chair, said. 13-minute 13, 13 bus journey up to the Quaggy family hub, 
Again, 10 minute bus journey somewhere else. A 13 minute journey again to, to another scent area. And like, you know, sort of the chair has already said, some of these parents or these mums themselves are quite vulnerable. And how do we expect them to get on buses with possibly young children, children in push chairs, and then one in arms? And also, is it not absolutely vitally important that the people who they are used to the parents and the children, and especially if the sent children, don't like anything new. They've already built up relationships with the people who help them. Just as important for the mums as the children. They know the area. They feel safe. Some people, you know, in, in one, yes, one of the areas where, where I'm um, a counsellor, they don't like to actually go out of that area where they feel safe. So, yes, I'm just saying, I can't understand where I was saying we want to make sure that services are local and personalised for families, but then we are just doing the opposite in sending them on bus journeys to somewhere that they don't know and that the children don't know, which and they desperately need continuation uh, of, of care, that they, something that they know. Sorry. Thank you. So, so sorry, I just, I just come in there. The, the, the bus journeys we have already mentioned, and I think some of this will come out in the consultation with families. Um, but I think, if I'm right, um, part of this, these proposals are to provide alternative hubs um, for families which are you know, um, more of an outreach. In my head, I call it outreach. I might be wrong, but I'll hand over to David. He's got, he's got the words better. So I just pick up on the, the children with um, disabilities point. So one of the challenges, which I think has probably been discussed here uh, for as well, is the pressure on our schools around children with special educational needs and disabilities, potentially around not having um, school places locally that can, that can meet their needs, which means that some young people um, can't go to school in the borough, you know, need to go outside. The other part is around potentially um, not always having the space that you'd want in the school, um, so that actually if you have a child with disability, the ability to take them to a sensory room or take them somewhere else can really be critical in terms of them thriving in education and learning. What we are putting forward as a proposal in this is that actually with some of that space, we want to turn that space into support uh, for schools for those children with special education needs. So that could be in the form of a child in the school who, who is already there and, and needs that additional space that they can then go to, as I say, potentially a sensory room, but also potentially designated specialist provision. So that's new places that are focused on providing additional support for particular needs. Um, so largely often it's around autism, uh, just because of the kind of scale of demand. So potentially it's new school places that can support some of our children with disabilities so that they can go to school in Greenwich rather than potentially having to go on a quite long bus ride into Lewisham, Bexley or where, where, wherever. So that's part of it, part of this proposal is around trying to develop that. I suppose the second part is um, around, and particularly when we're talking about families who have uh, many, you know, disabilities, but also it's often not just that, you know, there's many different things going on in, in families' lives that are causing change. And one of the key things that um, our children's centres do and, and it's not changing is actually some of that one-to-one -one support, that work in the home, that's not changing. Uh, you know, as, as part of this proposal, there will still be that support for families. There will still be support in the home for families, including our children with disabilities, um, to help support them in navigating a kind of whole range of different issues from dealing with the, the benefit system, dealing with the housing situation that they faced on top of how they navigate, you know, a complex health system, their child with disabilities. So I suppose this proposal still continues that support. And again, what we've aimed to do as part of this is try and help out on another area um, where we're finding a lot of pressure in terms of disabilities, which, as I say, we've, I, th I think it probably has come here before. 
Callum. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, can you just say a little bit more about, in the new provision model, exactly what is kind of meant by partner use? So looking at, for example, Robert Owen, which to declare an interest, that's where I went to nursery and I think went to the children's centre there when I was a, um, when I was smaller as well. Um, what exactly would you, do we mean by that? Because maybe I'm just being dense, but from looking at the explainer there, I'm slightly struggling to ascertain exactly what that means. Um, and then just secondly, you know, we talk about not closing children's centres. Uh, it feels like the language of satellite provision is perhaps quite a creative way of saying we're closing children's centres without closing children's centres. Um, to what extent is, is it that we are retaining the, that satellite presence being based at that location? Is that what we mean? Or are we literally saying, no, we're just providing the same services, but elsewhere? So I can pick up on the point around the partner use. When we talk about partner use, I suppose there's a couple of different things. One is, is partly where it's a school. It's, you know, it's the, the school as a partner delivering there. The, the other part, um, and so some of that also is around where it's, let's say, a nursery school. It's around them delivering additional childcare spaces as part of it, so them using it in terms of that. In the case of Robert Owen, we have also um, had discussions around the potential to use the space um, to potentially still deliver some stay and play, let's say, or what have you, but also to support in terms of potential local community groups that might need some space to, to deliver from. Um, so it kind of, it, it, it does vary, but I suppose when we talk about partner use, um, partner use, that's, that's kind of what it means. Um, in terms of the, the satellite provision, um, so the majority of what we're talking about here, we're expecting that will be delivered. That's not to say there's no impact, you know, clearly it's a really challenging situation. Um, but, you know, the, the vast majority of what we currently deliver will be kind of offered out in, in different community locations. Um, what that looks like, though, again, is going to depend on the feedback that we get from families. It's going to depend on what the sites are. What you can deliver from some sites is, is potentially restricted or expanded, actually, to be honest, depending on what, what it is. Um, so it's, I suppose one of the difficulties with this, aside from being opposed on this, what we're looking for, for feedback on is, it's, it, it would be much easier if we could say we you know, currently deliver every year in Greenwich 27 stay and plays, 10 of this, 20 of this, and therefore in the new one we're going to deliver this many of this, this many of this. But I guess because of that flexibility, it really is difficult, and that's why it's not as simple as saying it's this number of things that changes to this number of places, even like spaces. Um, and I suppose that's, that is part of, of the post around how we flex that. What that does also mean, though, is that we, you know, we have some amazing providers, we have all of our amazing providers, um, around children's centre uh, provision, and it is that constant development that they always do around, okay, well, what's the need, where can I deliver from? And we do some of this at the moment. I should probably say there is some of this um, provision that, that happens currently um, where we deliver from, from other sites. So we do deliver from some other schools that aren't on children's centres, but it is restricted. We can't, you know, on terms of the current thing, we can't deliver to as many different sites as, as we'd want to. Th thank you, David. Um, Pauline. Sorry, I'm st still confused about what other venues you're talking about. Because, it, you know, it's, it's totally unclear to me. You keep talking about that things are going to be delivered at different venues and different sites, but you haven't actually itemised, are we talking about church halls? Are we talking about libraries? What are we talking about and how do we, you okay. know, how do those commission? I'll try and answer some of that and David. So when Children's Centres started many, many years ago, Linda alluded to it with Sure Start at, at many, sort of back in sort of 80s, I think it was, wasn't it, Linda? Um, you had to be registered, even if it was a room, it had to be a registered children's centre. And there's a whole kind of suite of requirements on that uh, registration, including parent groups, um, and there was an Ofsted regulation and an Ofsted inspection. That Ofsted inspection went oh, many years ago, around about 2012, and all those requirements went. But many centres, and Greenwich kept their centres, many other places closed them, kept the name of children's centres, but all the accountability and the requirements of them went. They don't need to, they're not inspected anymore, and you can deliver provision, 
Dave talked about, sort of the Charlton Triangle. You can deliver provision now from other places. You couldn't back then. It had to be part of the inspection regime. So it might be church halls, it might be community centres, it might be another school, it might be a library. So this stage is the consultation about the proposals to move from very rigid children's centres that need reception centres, they need staffing those, they take up, you can't use it for anything else at all. So one children's centre is in Invictus School, it's a room in a school, but it has to still be registered and maintained. So we're trying to move beyond the walls of a children's centre to offer a much more flexible, into different satellite provision. As I said, libraries, uh, church halls, community centres, new provision, to offer a much more flexible approach to uh, early years provision and working alongside a range of partners to do that. This stage is the consultation about uh, the proposals to undertake that work. It's quite difficult for the team and for Dave to work out all the logistics of those different centres and we want it to be flexible and this isn't the staff consultation either. But the money that is spent on maintaining those buildings and those rooms and the reception facilities and all the other requirements that they do, we, those are part of the savings. Now, two million savings is you know, significant, so there might be staff, but we don't exactly know that yet because we've got to go through this process before we go into the next process. But Dave has worked very closely with the children's centre providers and our early years team and indeed the consultation will, is giving us lots more information about what it is that people are really, really interested in. So you mentioned the dance groups, stay and play is coming up a lot as the people are really valuing staying and playing. Um, and it's also helping us think about you know, the clarity between uh, PVI and preschool and nursery provision, that that's expanding and that provision which is uh, families have to, to stay uh, with their children. But, uh, and then the other part about the outreach into family homes, so that won't go at all. We're very, very committed to, to that. So I don't know if that's answered, I hope it's clarified for you, that children's centres, we think of them as these whole centres like Stortway. They're not. They're, it's a registration process that happened many years ago that we still got in Greenwich that's costing money. I hope that's helped. I think it is... Um, a very different mindset and I think this is good that we've I think it's good to discuss although we can't you know influence much before the consultation I would just like to make an observation I would just like to thank all the providers at the back there that have actually come here and, and thank you for giving up your time um, and well and just thank you for what you do um, and and uh, you know, and, and Dave, Dave and, and Florence and the team. This is going to be an ongoing discussion, I think. Um, and maybe this isn't the right place for me to ask this, and maybe this is asking really Adele, really. Um, I'm just assuming, I suppose we're all just assuming, there'll be a member's briefing about, about will there be a, a briefing for councillors um, on the consultation, or has it been and I missed it? But given the level of, of discussion that we've had this evening and interest, maybe, maybe we could put out a plea for an, an update after the consultation to, to make sure that, you know, as many people as possible uh, understand what's going on. Um, because I think this is something that's close to all our hearts, as everybody's proved. Yeah? Do, do, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Can I, I just also um, picked up before but made a plea. We really want to promote the consultation as much as possible. You know, please do encourage people to feedback. That's the only way that we can develop. That's the only way that we can learn. Think, you know, people might have um, other ideas that they can throw in. We really do want people to be kind of completing this and, and filling in because it's, it's not just a paper exercise. We, we, we really want to know what people think so we can help kind of inform the future. So just uh, uh, on that very briefly, um, I've, I've already flagged it to a number of residents who've been in touch with me about it. Um, 
have we got because you know the the pack's really good it's got good on the what happens next and also the in person consultations um do we have notices in some of the current children's centers to highlight those so that some of the service users are definitely aware that that's coming up i see head nodding perfect thank you very much Yes, Councillor Greenwell. Can I just say, I'm looking at the time period and it just seems very short. Early October results. And then is it coming to, to Council at the end of October? That doesn't seem that's a long period of time. Don't know, is that right? Adele is... So we've got a, for Cabinet decision, but what I would say is that's kind of draft timetable. We need to see what comes in. We need to review mm, that. That's we what need I mean, to see. Yes. So it's, it's, that's proposed, but it's not stuck it's in It's going stone. to take a long, long time, isn't it? To, to, well, well, I think you it, have your answer there, yeah. Councillor Greenwell. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Thank you very much, everybody that's contributed. That's really been helpful. So we can move now on to item eight, which is our work program schedule. Can't say much about that, really. Um, there it is. Uh, and our meeting schedule. Is everybody, everybody's in receipt of those? Yes. I don't know. I've got I've got the twenty third here. I don't know. What do you what do you have, Lorraine? Um I haven't got my diary. What do you have? Um we're just checking that. Nick. Yeah, we're just checking that. Um Should be the 22nd. Well spotted, Nick. It's the 22nd, not the 23rd. Has everybody got that? January is the 22nd. Perfect. Okay, and commissioning future reports, I don't think we want to tinker with that um, in any way. Um, and if there's no other comments, Florence, are you okay? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Adele, for coming. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for helping me through. Great. <laughs> well, I'm just